I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Seifter Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome to Arcane Welcome Mark. to the show. So today's topic is player tools research and learning. So this is the flip side of the question of GM, how do you run a research subsystem or do that kind of how thing? How do you get so, lore and information yeah. into the game for GMs? There's a lot of streams that talk about that. We've done one before that was roughly about that. But not that many people are talking about the player side of lore, of research and learning. So let's talk today about that from a player's perspective, both in-game as your character and out of game as the player who's playing the character. So let's start off with the case where the setting that the game is set in has some published material that you could read or access as opposed to a uh, as opposed to like a fully homebrew setting where the GM is the one who's generating things. That's right. So in either case, research and learning that is performed may or may not have a disjunction between your out-of-character knowledge of the setting and your in-character knowledge of the setting. Mm -hmm. If the GM is making everything up as they go along, unless they were like telling another player and just did it in a public space, you probably will get the information about the setting in lockstep to your character because when the GM tells you, it's probably because your character found out. With what Linda talked about, which is a published setting, it's possible for you to be able to gain information about the setting that your character doesn't have. Uh, but just because of the fact that you read something online or in a book that your character might not have now, known. Now, there can be a few different reasons that your character doesn't have it. It could be that your character, you know, doesn't have high enough skills or what have you to know that particular fact. Or it could be that that thing that it is in the published source is not true in your particular game. So it may be, for example, that your GM is mostly running with the published setting, but they're, they change something up or they're running it at a slightly different time period. And the, the material that you're reading is from 10 years ago and they've updated certain aspects or they've decided to customize certain things or like things have changed based on the activities of your PCs. Or you played something that was in a an organized play that was set in the past or the future because it was written multiple years in a different time. And now a character has suddenly become older or younger and a bunch of plot has happened with them or unhappened with them. Yes. So there are many times that your knowledge or even in an organized play setting, your character's experiences may jar with uh what's about to happen in a published one of the classic things that that you can see with this too is where there are certain things that are considered to be little known in a setting but are revealed in setting materials so like you know rasmir the living god God is a fake yeah where like you know a lot of people in character don't know that you know some might be a little some may be suspicious but many aren't uh, but like, you know, if you read the, the setting books and it'll just flat out tell you that. So there, there can be cases where, you know, the setting books in the interest of giving a more definitive answer, um, give the sort of correct or expected answer to a given mystery, whereas your PCs wouldn't necessarily know what that is. Right. So in this case, it's partially about setting books that are written well in terms of not spilling out the secrets too much. Uh, because in many cases, a GM loves to have a player who is engaged enough that they actually want to learn about the setting and want to learn the things that somebody should know for that setting. Uh, but setting books vary pretty wildly as to how many spoilers they give. For example, um, the Guide to Corvosa from Pathfinder uh, First, actually, I guess it was written in 3.5, <laughs> has a chapter at the end that's full of spoilers. But as long as everything that is a spoiler is, is sort of separated out into that chapter. And so I built an elf who was living in Corvosa for a hundred years. And so the GM said, just don't go into that chapter, but you should read everything else. Your character probably knows anything that is not in that chapter as part of just your local knowledge of the area. And so that was an easy way to separate things out because that book was organized well. Similarly, the world of Battle Zoo Indigo Isles is written from the perspective of people who live in the Isles. And while it may have some answers it could be correct to mysteries. It's always the speculations like, well, some people think it's this or that. 
We're not sure. However, on the flip side is the Eberron campaign setting, which famously, right on the reverse page of like an important player rule that players would have to look up all the time if they're doing certain characters, is a sidebar that's like, oh yeah, the guy who's in charge of this one nation that is a peaceful nation, that is not like the warmongering neutral good queen, he's a vampire secretly and nobody knows that he's a vampire. Mm -hmm. It's just like right in your face and it's like, oh my gosh, this is ruins one of the like major mysteries of the entire setting. Why was this here? So you will want to check with your GM about like if they have any thoughts about uh, what content would be good or not so good to read. Like it may be the case that there's some content that could be useful but has major spoilers in it. And so they might be like, oh, you know check out these pages, but maybe not these pages or things like that. Um, but generally the kind of information that's going to be useful as you're looking for things in a published uh, setting as a player are going to be things that are related to, you know, your characters, uh, your characters sort of background and origin. Uh, you know, if you're th things that will help you flesh out their backstory and help you understand the area where the area where things are being set if your character would have familiarity with that. So like you'd say that your character is local to the region where the adventure is being set, like Mark's example character, then and they're good at knowing things. Then having that information in the background to help reference stuff can be super useful. Or having that information to say, you know, oh, you know, my character is... Uh, you know, my character is from Taldor, and I was reading about Taldor, and I know that opera is a big thing in Taldor, so maybe my character is a fan of opera, or is like a former opera singer, or something like that. And coming up with those types, those types of links can be really useful, because those types of links aren't like, you know, my character was the, the most famous person, or the best person, or things like that. Uh, so, because sometimes when you see, when you do research and you'll see things that are like set there as plot hooks for a GM to pick up on, um, you'll want to check with the GM before grabbing a big plot hook and attaching your character to it because the story may have other plans there and then you could run into a, a conflict. Even if you don't even see a plot hook, you can potentially wind up in... A weird situation if you use the information from uh, a setting book, even a player's guide that's provided to you without checking with your GM first. For example, um, I was playing a pre-written adventure path and they had a bunch of names of different things. And there was a noble family that clearly looked like they weren't very important and they weren't. So I decided to have my character be like the son of that noble family. They were just like minor annoying nobles who didn't matter. And fortunately, they didn't matter that much in the AP. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was looking at other annoying nobles. I was like, well, in this city, apparently there's like a, a faction that is like anti-harbor master. And they're like vaguely pirates. And the, my character's noble family is not the greatest anyway. So maybe they were trying to make me marry, like, the daughter of that noble family whose name was listed in the player's guide. And so, uh, and they don't really like each other. Mm -hmm. So um, that was part of my character's backstory that I put in. So it turned out that the first thing we had to do was, like, a, um, attack the harbor master because he was doing evil stuff, which, like, the, my character's, like, reluctant... Um, family we're trying to set them up would be happy about because she doesn't like the harbor master yeah and then not only that um while he was like trying to scheme and uh i think talk to her about it he figured out that she was harboring like the evil brother of the person who hired us to attack the harbor master who was like the main patron of the entire adventure path and the evil brother was like some kind of recurring villain that we weren't supposed to find but that she had him and they wanted to get the inheritance that was from the, our patron's family, which we had found a way to get into. So I baited the, the pirate lady and the like recurring villain, who I did not know was a recurring villain, to come to the vault where the inheritance was. I was like, I know how to get it. We can just get the thing that you want. But I had left the rest of my adventuring party in the vault so that when all of us went into the vault and it locked and could not be opened, 
that the these two villainous characters would be trapped in there with uh, my entire party, and then we would beat the crap out of them. And uh, this is an online game. And the GM, like, never came back after that because he couldn't figure out what to do because the entire plot didn't work if the evil brother didn't get away and do the plot, apparently. I don't know the details because the game fell apart. Yes. So sometimes, and I, I guess I actually checked with the GM, and he didn't realize, based on that being my backstory, that I was then going to do that in the game. He would just probably think, oh, that's funny because she's kind of an antagonist and yeah. the character doesn't like her that much, so it'll probably be fine. But in general, yeah, checking with the GM to make sure that that they can... Uh, because those kinds of things can lead to really great and interesting developments. As long if as it GM wasn't an adventure path, I think to... that would have been really interesting that we... that uh, that Like, yeah. it didn't expect us to bring the evil brother into the place with the item he wanted and get him this close, except we had already taken the item out secretly mm -hmm. and then left the party members in there. Yep. Uh, yeah. Also, if my character was really a scoundrel, I could have left the party members locked inside of the vault, and um, they would have they would have been in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So um, the point about this is that information can lead to a much richer game, but it can also sometimes do so in a way that actually can cause issues. So um, keep that in mind when you are researching and when you're connecting things in. Now, sometimes. Research and learning is done purely in character, and that's because even if it's not a pre-published adventure, maybe you you happen to know this information because it's part of like the game mechanics, but your characters wouldn't know. Like I don't know, there was a hazard that was one of the standard hazards for the core rulebook that you recognize, but your character yeah, your doesn't. characters doesn't know it. So or um, like a ritual, uh, same situation. In that case. Um, or in any case where you, you have an inkling of something that you think your character wouldn't know, and you're wondering, what do I do? Like, I shouldn't just act on this information that only mm -hmm. I have, but if I just ignore it, then um, that's not good either, because the GM may have been trying to put clues in there. So remember, the GM is your eye and window into the world. We tell this to game masters all the time in GM tools. Your GM might be inexperienced, or maybe for some reason they didn't think of doing this. So, as a player, it's totally okay to ask the GM, Hey, can I roll a recall knowledge to see if I know um, what... I feel like there may have been some clues about, like, this thing that we just saw. If I know of anything that's related to... And then the thing that you think is connected yeah. to the ritual. And then, or... and then sort of connected to that. If there's something that you know that you want your character to be... Some knowledge that you out of character know but want and want your character to be able to act on because you think it could be interesting. Then you can talk to the GM about it and be like, hey, you know, I, you know, I, I think my character, you know, I, like, I think it would be cool if, like, my character might discover this thing with this other noble family. But, uh, you know, they don't know that. So, like, is there a way that they, that, like, things might allow them to find right. it out? Or maybe, like, you find a reason for them to, like, look up things about the noble activities in the area and then the GM knows that that's something that you out of character would like to do. In the same way that like if a GM knows that you are really interested in getting access to a particular uncommon option then you know they can find ways to seed that in letting them know the knowledge that you want to have. Or let's say in the example where you can tell that something is based on a particular ritual that your character doesn't know. Nobody mm -hmm. in the party does. So you ask the GM to roll your call knowledge. The GM's like, well, you know, you think it could be related to some kind of a ritual, but you, you know, you failed. You don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So you could have your character be like, okay, I think it might be, but I don't have enough information. I'm going to go to an occultic library and research it. You, research is not always just something the GM pulls out and says, well, now the adventure says to do some research. You can prompt mm -hmm. that you'd like to go research something. And, and maybe, that, that, is, gives, maybe yeah. that gives hooks for more adventures because maybe the villain who's doing the occult ritual hears that someone is in the library asking about it and they send goons to try to disrupt your research or, uh, or a whole bunch of other things could happen based on that that give the GM a lot of options. And, you know, if that could, whether that is like going to a library or something that might trigger the research subsystem or like, you know, doing a... Go, doing like a gather information around town to try to figure things out you know if you have something that you want your pcs to know that they don't know whether whether you know what it is or not then I, gms really appreciate when in general when players come to them and say 
that they want to learn more about something because then like the players are driving the story it forward. signals to the gm what you're interested in mm -hmm. and if they aren't following the first law of dungeon craft the first rule of dungeon craft to not create more than they need to to do things kind of like in programming just in time then they know what what they should create more of because they know what you're interested in seeing and so that's why it can be very useful even if it's something your gm created so exactly you don't know you don't know, but you, you have an inkling that it's something related to some information you don't know. So it's a known unknown. You can try to ask if you can research, if you can learn more. You can experiment to learn more mm -hmm. about it. Any kind of thing that could let the GM create more adventures, give you some downtime goals to perform, or otherwise make the play experience richer because of the fact that you're you're tapped in and you want to learn something, whether you know it out of the game or not. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of learning and characters is the is the disconnect between you know how uh, the character would learn something and how the player would learn something. So, like for a player, you're only generally accessing the relevant parts of that character's life and not all of the other things that are coming up to distract them. So for some small details, it might be easier for you as a player to remember them than the character would. But on the flip side, when it comes to things that like would be really important to the character, it's probably easier for the character to remember it than you as the player, particularly if it's been a while. Or since yeah, you've... even small details, if, if it was like literally five seconds ago for the character but you broke the session mm -hmm. and then didn't play for a month probably the character's memory is way better than yeah. yours even for the things that were pretty relevant similarly it um because of the fact that you're taking a window on things that are usually relevant it can lead to issues where you wind up if you wind up learning a fact there's sort of a Chekhov's gun in there that it's actually probably important and it's like, not why did the GM bother giving detail? extra descriptions about this particular, well, about this particular NPC more than the other seventeen people at the party? That tells me that they're significant. Like this is a thing we we think about in published adventures. It's like if you order um, art for like only one of the NPCs at the party, and then you show that one art of the NPC, or you know, it, it makes them feel so much more important. So there's sort of that aspect of things that stand out 100%. or things might also stand out because um, things might also stand out because they are something that you out of character know is significant, but your character shouldn't know that that's the thing that like they should pay most. That's attention. right. So Lava being had a question. So, you know, you got this information, but how do you track this knowledge between you and the GM? It depends on your group. Uh, one thing that could be good is if you have a wiki or some other site that can hold information then everybody in your group, uh, including the GM, can contribute information that is, has become public knowledge to the group during the course of the adventure and that your group is presumed to have remembered by this point in time mm -hmm. um, and have maybe even taken notes in character and written down in a journal or something like that. So this is particularly useful in situations where there's a fair bit of information. So like if you are doing an investigation and there's multiple NPCs or if you are... If you're in a situation where there are one of the pages I really like maintaining for our groups as a player uh, is a uh, quest quest hooks page where it's where we talk about like, you know, what are all of those plot hooks that we have at some point? Somebody has at some point said they want to pursue. And that way, anytime we're think we're sitting there thinking, hmm, what should we do next? We can go back to our our plot hooks page. And then once a plot hook is resolved, then I can replace the like go investigate what's going on on the underbridge with like you know underbridge we determined that the that the reason the dire rats were gaining wings in the underbridge is that there was a there were alchemical experiments that were going on that were led by a person but that were led by julia and julia seems to have ties to the same mysterious criminal syndicate that works with Norgor as the Norgor cultist that we discovered in this other area or whatever. So you can then turn the plot thread list into like a list of like here's the things for investigating and for putting the putting the story together. That can help direct people as well, especially in a homebrew campaign where they can go where they want. 
So we have another question about is what your character knows at a given instance completely independent from all their previous experience? For instance, let's say you were called on successfully about something and then you encounter it again later. What I would say is that it's one thing to know a piece of information right now. It's another to know it like, you know, a few months later in a tense situation uh, without being, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue while you're being shot at by flaming arrows and burned by a fire breath. So I would say that if the if the character knew it already or learned it from previously fighting this creature, I would significantly lower the difficulty mm -hmm. of the check and I would uh, for that character. Yeah. And um, but uh, to remember it again. And if it was like right afterwards, I might even waive the check because it was like, yeah, you literally just fought this like two minutes ago. The other instance in which I would waive the check is if like that particular fact became part of like a very salient story, like you know. The, the group was surprised by the fact that this creature had the ability to disgorge you know, thousands of gallons of water and flood the area and the character and like that player's character almost drowned and died because of that. Like remembering that like really salient ability would be something to be like, yeah, you remember that was the thing that did that thing and you almost drowned. But then like remembering the specifics of, ah, yes, you know, you recall that its spines have a poison that can dull the reflexes like maybe you wouldn't remember that so much since that wasn't like the the thing that people are later on being like oh yeah remember that encounter that was wild yes when thinking about whether or not characters would like kind of automatically remember from their previous fight think about how distinctive this pe or it doesn't even have to be a fight think about how distinctive this piece of information is from mm -hmm. other similar ones for example how many aberrations are just weird tentacled things that kind of look decently similar to each other? I know that when um, when Liz, uh, Luis, and I were doing a game show with uh, Rise of the Rule Lord, there was like a who's that aberration mm -hmm. part of it where there was just a silhouette and it was like, which aberration could that be? It was not trivial to even determine it, even knowing what the pictures look like because there's so many aberrations that look pretty similar to each other. So the point there being that that is probably more distinctive than, say, uh, say I guess, like the Grim Reaper is. And even then, the Grim Reaper looks somewhat like other undead, although it has certain features about it that could be, um, that could be distinctive. Or a Mimitim Psychopomp, which also kind of looks like the Grim Reaper and is a completely different creature. So even the example I gave there it turned out it, it had some things that were pretty different. Uh, let's say, I don't know, a Hydra. Yeah. They're pretty distinctive because they have a, a tons of heads or a Hecatonchires with its hundred hands. Yeah, where it's like, okay, there's nothing. Yeah, I'm going to mistake that. You're for. probably not going to mistake that for something else as easily. So those might be ones that you're more likely to uh, just be like, okay, yeah, you fought a Hecaton Kyries before. Also, you're, what level are you even? If you're yeah. still alive from that, <laughs> you recognize it the next time. Now, there was another question that I actually, I actually wanted to do one more thing on oh, that. Oh, yeah, one more thing um, for this. So, so for that example where you might have identified something as like, you know, a psychopomp or an undead, there are certain baseline information that I would say that you probably should just say, yeah, you, uh, yeah, you know that. So, like, you're not going to have a situation where the PC, like, knows the properties of un standard properties of undead one time and then, like, three levels later, oh, oops, I forgot that undead, the basic properties of undead. But you may solve a situation where it's like, oh, I misidentified this undead as a psychopomp. Therefore, yes. here's the things I know about Where you didn't pumps. think it was an undead. Yeah, but you still would, like, know, the like, some of the broad, like, Especially if it was an undead that yeah. kind of looked like it could be something else. Yeah. Like... Even, there's psychopomp, you're like, oh, this is probably Katrina psychopomp. But there's also just some, that, like, vampire, maybe you didn't think that was an undead. Or mm -hmm. witch fire, maybe you thought it was a fire elemental. It's just yeah. this burning lady and that's And then you'd be the like, air. oh, yeah, the thing you know about, like, fire elementals is this and that and the other thing. It's like, okay, it's correct information about fire elementals. You've dealt with fire elementals before as a broad class. And but some of it is actually not... correct about witch fires. Yeah. Just not most of it. So, um... That actually segues into what if about if information is wrong. 
such as from a critical failure in Pathfinder 2 on a recall knowledge or dubious knowledge where some of it is right and some of it is wrong or any other game rule system where sometimes you can get wrong information instead of just either always being right or not knowing anything at all. Well, first of all, um, if you have other similar examples that are possible identifiers like the ones Mark was just talking about there where it's like, oh, this is like where, where you might think, hey, this is, this is incorrect. Uh, but you can kind of see where things are coming from. Also, it could be something that is right but partially right but wrong in some significant way like maybe you know that that you do correctly remember that this creature has a strong elemental weakness but you misremember what element it is and then it's like and then so then the players might be like oh okay like i guess it wasn't fire maybe try something else so generally i would say to say something that sounds remotely plausible that someone would think with their if they were recalling mm -hmm. knowledge that sort of in try to be in character for them like sh sure your players might be like oh great now we know this is wrong so we can ignore it if you were like oh that fiery witch fire is weak, weak to, to fire. fire and is strong against um is strong against force for some reason but like if it's something if it's like oh it's an undead and it's weak to negative it has like a weakness to positive energy but you said oh it's fire so it has a i don't actually remember what it I is i think so, they're weak to cold yeah, it also and, okay so if you, you would have actually been right if you said it was weak to cold okay but, so right so you need you need uh you need something else for you need something saying else that it was an elemental and that it was alive yeah, it's the elemental, could have messed yeah. them up in other ways so it's just like yeah so it's like it's an elemental and therefore yeah uh so and then they might expect oh plausible. we can safely we can safely like use harm or whatever to attack the yes. to attack the other things in the combat and it's not going to heal it or whatever also try to say something wrong that's interesting mm -hmm. rather than just like boring or irrelevant that's not always easy to do on the fly but yeah like if you were like okay the thing that is wrong uh, when they ident misidentified this witch fire is that i'm going to say that they love the opera which they yeah. don't. It's like, it doesn't matter that they, they love They tap dance on toil days. Uh, unless whatever. maybe they, they, you have an opera singer in your party who is then going to be like, yeah. wait, they love the opera. Don't attack them. Yeah. But um, having something that's interesting or that will lead to interesting action or something interesting down the line for the characters yeah. is um, is a lot more, uh, is a lot better to Where do. Where there's some that way is that more you can from expect the, This that, question yeah. is more from the GM side mm -hmm. than the players. Yeah. But, but where you can expect that the players might act on that knowledge to do something that's different from what they would knew, do if they knew the truth. Yes. Also, as a GM, try to make it so that the thing that they do that's different is not like something that's so catastrophic that their characters just instantly die. Like a false recall knowledge check that tells you to drink from the wrong grail in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and then you'd shrivel into a skeleton and instantly die. Because players from your side, like, if your character has false information from bad recall knowledge, even if you think it's wrong because maybe you actually know what the answer is, mm -hmm. that's what your character thinks. Maybe you can be convinced by someone else with yeah. a different op opinion, but that's what you think. And hoping that your GM doesn't give you a Last Crusade situation where you just die instantly from the bad information, um, you should generally have your character act as if that's what they remember it being yeah and it may be the case that you know you're in a party where like your character knows they're not like the most knowledgeable on arcane matters and like the three wizards in the party are like yeah you're definitely wrong on that one and then maybe maybe like they have a standard thing where if the three wizards think that they they're incorrect then they're like okay yeah maybe i didn't remember that correctly but like having Sort of a consistent plan for how your character will handle when they disagree makes sense. So then, for example, let's say that your character is like, I'm the wizard and I know the most, I am the most, I have the deepest wells of arcane lore of anyone in the party. And so their policy is to always believe that they're correct. 
If and it's Arcana, then it's Arcana, they, oh, then they're, they're right. The other person's always wrong. But, but, then, but they might have rolled but the then natural one. when they fail, one. then you know it's it's fair to still act as if they think they're right, or like vice versa. If they're if they always are like, oh yeah, this person knows more than me on this subject, so if we disagree, I'll defer to them, and then maybe they know out of character. Oh, actually, my character was right this time. Following that consistent policy, yes, makes you that's what handle things more that's fairly. what I always do as a player. And if I'm not either of those two people, I usually defer to the one who seems like they know more. Mm -hmm. So I'll be like, yeah, my policy is that if anybody disagrees about religion, that I'm going to the cleric. I'm gonna think the cleric is right, and sometimes the cleric was wrong, um, and that was funny because my character just backed up the cleric and says, "Ah, the cleric's usually right. I don't know about you, champion. You don't really know that much about your own religion." Or sometimes I've had uh, characters who are like more peacemakers in the party, and then when people disagree, they're like, "Ah, oh, well." Um, I mean, I was thinking maybe it was this, but they think it's this, and we don't really know. So I guess we don't really know for sure. So let's like plan what we would do if either of these is true, and try to come around to a solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, another point that's very important that Linda talked about, about the basic undead traits, is that you may want to consider, as a group, this is we're still a little bit more in GM Tools mm -hmm. territory here. Sorry about that, players. Um, is when you're rolling a check, it doesn't have to have only one difficulty that you're comparing it to yeah so you might be comparing it to the difficulty of that specific creature see if they figure out what creature it is as well as the difficulty of like a, a creature type that it blatantly apparently belongs to mm -hmm. so if there's something that looks like it's almost definitely is either a construct or an elemental and they're not sure and let's say they don't critically fail they fail regular fail mm -hmm. to identify the creature and but it's like, blatantly well, it's like well it's you, either a construct or a elemental and, and you're you know like you don't identify the creature elemental. because it was like a level 18 mm -hmm. goal or something uh it, and you're like you you you're pretty sure it's a construct or an elemental and you know you got a a, a 25 which is it was bad for you on a roll but it was not enough to identify this creature but you definitely know the base rules, if it is a construct, then this is true. If mm -hmm. it is an elemental, then that is true. And you're not sure which one. Uh, it may even be something else, but it does kind of look like a construct or an elemental. But, yeah. you know, sometimes there's like undead that died in this earth and now they come back as stone. So it could be a third thing. But for the things that it's most likely for the to be. things so that looks like it could be one of those, it, even and if you so didn't succeed. you can compare against multiple multiple difficulties or like. If you see a giant red dragon and you roll high enough to identify a young red dragon, but not the ancient red dragon that this is, you might be like, okay, you're pretty sure there's a more powerful version of young red dragon. Young red dragons, young red dragons generally have, have these abilities, abilities. but you, you, you don't, don't know, know what, what other has. abilities they get yeah. when they get older because those uh, dragons usually eat any of the researchers who come to check, yes. to check up what abilities they just gained. Mm -hmm. But... When they're, when, when they're young, they have this, so it's probably that plus some more stuff. So you can always do that to try to, and as a player, you can ask your GM if you failed to identify a, a creature that seems to be a more powerful version of another creature, you can be like, okay, but is it obviously a more powerful version of a weaker creature? And if so, might my character know about that one? Yeah. And that's a good way to handle the issue where people are like, why could I identify this baby dragon but not the mama dragon that's like right next to it? Like you find some kind of giant killer zombie and it's like, well, do you know, maybe you don't know the special abilities of this type of giant killer zombie, but maybe you know like the basic properties of zombies. And you're so you wouldn't just be like, this is a baby red dragon and some weird red lizard that's yes. right next to it that I don't know what it is at all. Mm -hmm. It's probably a salamander. Oh, I see. There's a I tried listening at a door to figure out what was on the other side of the door and failed. The GM said it sounded like an earth elemental. I went along with it until it started to flood the room and tried to drown me. But the GM said, nope, you think it's earth. It didn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, that's an example of one where, that's like... That's a good example of one that's so ludicrous. When, when, it, when, that... it is, when it is so far off, then, like, it's hard to roleplay why your character would still think that that's true. Yes. Um, so, in that case, generally, like... You know, it makes most sense to play your character realizing, wait, something feels off. Or, 
um, or like to work with a GM to figure things out. So, so, so then it might be like, oh, it's it's the rare mud variant of the Earth Elemental or something like that. Um, so yeah, or or your GM could say that uh, you hear some sounds on the other side of the door and you identify them as a um, a water jinxer, which is a rare type of thing that creates illusory water that tries to trick people into wasting their time flailing around and trying to swim in the water and hold their breath when really the water's not real. So you could just breathe in it normally and mm -hmm. uh, just walk through it if you disbelieve. Yes. And so then at least when you open the door and there's water there, they'll be like, oh, you'll be like, oh, there's water. This is from the water jigsaw or something like that. Uh, oh, I keep failing to disbelieve, but everybody, this is this is not real water. It's just fake water. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, any advice for players asking, how do I do X when knowing how to and being able to do have separate requirement, mechanical requirements? Crafting recipes come to mind. So, like, if you have a specific thing that you want to craft, I mean, you can, just like if there are other things that your character is interested in doing, you can let the GM know, hey, you know, I'd like to look Try for this to uncommon research thing. It. I want to see research it. See if the GM it, yeah. will let you research it, see if you can find it as a treasure, or even research where it might be found as a treasure. For example, maybe the GM will be like, well, no, it's not just in the library here. But in the library, you see notes that in the ancient empire of Jiska, they made constructs using techniques similar to this item that you want to craft. There may be formulas for the item you're looking for if you go to the Jiskin ruin of Rachikan. And now you've got a new adventure to find that item. Like, uncommon and rare uh, um, stuff partially exists to help motivate people to adventure. Because it's not just something you can just go to the marketplace and find. What if you have a recipe but the character can't use it mechanically? Um, if it's something that they they can't use, like, yet, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, on another level where, sure, they'll be able to use it, then that's one thing and you can wait. But if it's like, oh, well, our characters have literally no way to use this and we definitely want to make it, then you might be able to, like, instead do a quest to search for an NPC. Like, okay, yeah, we want to look around for someone who can do this. And then that tells the GM, okay, GM, you know, they're, the PCs want to do this. And so then they can decide, you know, is this something that can just be resolved by throwing gold pieces into the problem? Or are they going to need to, like, are the PCs going to need to collect rare ingredients? Or are they going to need to do some kind of a favor for the person who can craft them? Is the person who can craft that thing, like, really busy with some other things at the moment and needs to be extricated from a particular situation we've mentioned in previous gym tools episode about giving a reward to players that might be a special version of a formula that allows the players to craft without meeting the prerequisites possibly by gathering rare ingredients on a quest possibly not and just it's like yeah you have this weird super optimized version of this one particular formula that was created by the ancients and yeah, for, for some reason it allows a level 8 character to craft, 8 or above, to craft a plus 2 pug zero. The DC is still the same, so you might fail, but you can try, and normally you have to be level 10. And that can be a way to give a reward, because someone in a previous arcade market was like, mm -hmm. what if the only thing my players want is like very common items, because they're mm -hmm. just obsessed with those, but I want to give recipes... But they already have the recipes for that because it's in their book. And so we mentioned you could give like special recipes. Like this is a special recipe that does that. Or this is a special recipe that always makes the plus two pugsy room with a, with one of the quirks from the list of quirks. Or like some kind of very, very, very minor benefit that is not so much that it it, it drives everything out of control. But that mm -hmm. is free. So like if because you have this recipe now you make this item in this way. And if the if you have a recipe that your characters can't use mechanically and they also like are like yeah we don't really actually need that then maybe you can use that recipe as a bargaining chip to find other knowledge like maybe you can maybe you can go to a local crafting guild and trade that recipe for a recipe that your characters can use that they want. That's right. So basically the when it comes to research, learning, lore and knowledge as a player um, your role here in a lot of ways is to, if you're basically, if your GM is not giving you the information that you'd like to see, either because they don't know that you want it, or maybe they're new and they, they probably should have given it to your group, but they didn't think about it, or they have a lot to juggle, mm -hmm. prompt them, ask for it, say that your character is interested in learning about something similar. If it's a 
if it's something that should be an unknown unknown because mm -hmm. your character wouldn't even know that they didn't know it, then you could talk out of character with the GM and, and be, be like, like hey, my character doesn't cool even know that I'm happened. missing yeah. this kind of information or that it even exists. But it seems kind of cool to me. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And they might say no. And they might have their reasons. But it can a lot that takes some of the pressure off the GM to do everything at once. And generally, GMs like players who are engaged and who help provide them new hooks to um, bring the game in new and uh, different directions than they might have even expected. All right. You have anything else you wanted to discuss here? No, I think that's good. Shall we say goodbye to YouTube? Yes, let's. Bye, YouTube friends. Bye.